Dr. Stephen Bramer is professor of Bible exposition and serves as chair of the Bible exposition department. He's just returned from a year of sabbatical during which he traveled, spoke, taught, studied, and wrote. He has a special interest in uh, Israel and Jordan, traveling to those countries a couple of times during his sabbatical. He serves as an adjunct professor at the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary and the Word of Life Bible College in Hungary and the Montana Wilderness School of the Bible. In addition to serving here at DTS, on the weekends he ministers as teaching pastor at the Waterbrook Bible Church in uh, Wiley, a church that he helped plant nine years ago. Uh, Stephen and Sharon celebrated their 38th wedding anniversary and are the grateful parents of three children, one of whom, Joshua, is a third year student here at DTS, and they are the proud grandparents of six grandchildren. He loves the written word and he loves the living word. And his message today is entitled, I'm Satisfied With. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Bramer? I must admit that I wonder why I'm up here speaking. Last Tuesday, President Mark Bailey spoke, and I am not the president of Dallas Theological <laughs> Seminary. Last Wednesday, two of our patriarchs, Dr. Campbell and Dr. P, spoke. I'm 59 years of age, I'm the youngest full-time member of the Bible X department, and I feel like a rookie still in our department. On Thursday, Dr. John Hanna spoke and used a cacophony of expressions. I just love that word, I'm going to use it in my sermon. <laughs> and he knows our history and he knows what makes us tick. And then on Friday, Dr. Ron Allen, one of our senior professors at Bible Exposition, spoke. I tried to think back to what I had read in grade four. I believe I read the complete works of my cousin's comic collection of Archie at that <laughs> point in time. But I am uh, excited and honored to be here to speak to you this morning on a topic that I've been praying about and studying and seeking to apply to my own life, the topic of contentment. This past summer, I made a few poor choices over a few days. I was about to prepare a meal for my wife and I, and uh, I reached into the very back of a drawer that has a cacophony of, <laughs> kit of, of kitchen utensils in there, and, and I began to draw my hand forward. I was trying to grab some sticks at the back, and, and I felt something poke my finger, and my automatic reaction was to yank my hand out. It was this fork that was sticking and wedged against the front of the door when I reached back there, and it went into my finger, and then I yanked it. And it really, really hurt. And, and, and I tried to jerk it out, and I realized it's not coming this way, and so I now need to actually take my hand and put it to the back of the drawer, since it had gone in this finger and had come out the end of the finger. It was kind of finger kebab uh, at that point in time. <laughs> and um, I'm doing a happy little dance uh, in the kitchen as I'm trying to get my hand out of the drawer as blood is spurting into the drawer. I got it out and uh, didn't quite know what to do, so I immediately put it in my mouth. Uh, <laughs> because I realized if I didn't, I was going to have to clean up not only the drawer, but the kitchen. And, and um, so I had it in my mouth for a few minutes. I, I realized I was breaking all sorts of kosher laws of the Old Testament, but <laughs> I'm under the New Covenant, so I'm okay. And, and, um, I, I'm hopping around, moaning, and um, if you're going to hurt that bad, you might as well get some sympathy. So I, I ran into the room where my wife was, and she just looked at me kind of funny, and I realized I, I can't even say anything because I've got it in my mouth. So I ran into our, our restroom, and I got a pile of uh, toilet paper, and I put it on my finger and squeezed real hard and came back and in an excited voice uh, began to tell her what had happened and said, you need to go the hospital. 
I said, why would I need to go to the hospital? She said, because you need to get that hand looked after. It always bothers me that my wife doesn't realize I'm a doctor. You know? <laughs> And, and, and so I reminded her that I've spent years studying to be called a doctor and, and I didn't need to go. And she said, what are you going to do about it? And um, I said, uh, I'll take care of it. And so uh, for the next few hours, I wrapped it in paper towel. Uh, sometimes I would spread some triple antibiotic cream on the paper towel, but it just kept getting very, very bloody. So I had to squeeze real, real hard. And, after a few hours, I think it was beginning to clot, but it was time for bed. So what does a man do? I got lots of paper towel, and I went out to the garage and got duct tape. <laughs> and the amazing thing, if you wrap duct tape tight enough around paper towel, it's not too bad. It still hurt, but a little bit of Tylenol helps. and, and I went to bed. In the morning when I took it off, it had almost stopped bleeding by that point. And after a few hours, I was able to get some uh, butterfly stitches on there. Uh, my wife is gently, once in a while, suggesting perhaps you should see a real doctor. <laughs> and um, it bothers me that she doesn't trust me. <laughs> a couple days later, I went to church. I explained the situation at our church, Waterbrook Bible Fellowship in Wiley, and a first year DTS student had the gall to come up and suggest that I go see a doctor. <laughs> Bernie is, his profession is to take care of people like me who do stupid things on job sites, and so he suggested, you know, since he's first, if he had had a couple of footnotes in Trabian style for why I should go, I would have been willing to accept it, but he's just a first year student. And he, he, he's explained, uh, now, Dr. Bramer, you, you could get infection. When was the last tetanus shot you had? I said, what's a tetanus shot? He said, you really need to go. Well, by the next day, four days later, I, I decided that perhaps I should consult with a fellow doctor and... Uh, so I went down to the little clinic that's down the street. I was hoping not to bump into the doctor who had had to see a few months previous, that when I was in Jordan, I had been down into an archaeological site, found a piece of 2,000-year-old Roman glass, was so excited I was climbing up. I got about 15 feet up, and a rock gave way, and I crashed down and really cut my elbow bad, got some Jordanian dirt in there. What really bothered me is I couldn't find the Roman glass anymore, and I'm bleeding. And, and a month after I got back, I had to go in and get the elbow drained and the dirt taken out. You'd think I'd learn, right? I'm just hoping, don't let me see that same doctor. He's going to think I'm foolish. But uh, I found another doctor, and uh, he uh, looked at it and said, well, it is infected, and you do need antibiotics. Now why? Why would a reasonably intelligent man not go and get the help that he needs? Because I don't like needles. I'm not that crazy about medical people. <laughs> See, for five years I used to have to go get my blood taken three times a week and they used to stick me in there and take ten tubes of blood and they practiced on me and and finally they gave me a new kidney, which I was very, very thankful for. And every three months I still go down the street here. And, the, and, and I just prefer not to have more needles. And because I think I know better than most medical people, that I can take care of myself, that, that it won't get infected. And you know what I do in my, with my physical life, I often do with my spiritual life. There are things that cause me pain, things that cause me discomfort, things that cause me uh, to realize I, I need some help. But sometimes I'm just too proud to go and get the help that I need. This morning I would like to speak to you on the subject of contentment. It is something that we all should have and we all need. And yet so many times as I look at my own life, I realize I, I, I'm not going about obtaining contentment the way the scripture would indicate to me. I, I'm looking for contentment in my own ways. 
And so if you've got your Bible, I want to encourage you to open it up to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 10 through 13. As I was studying on contentment, a little chorus came to my mind, a hymn that we used to sing when we were uh, just kids. I hesitate to even mention it because once I mention it, all of the professors who are my age, this this melody is going to stick in their mind for the rest of the uh, day. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold, but in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one that's silver lined. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old, and someday yonder we will never more wander but walk on streets that are purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound. I'm but a pilgrim in search of the city. I want a mansion, a harp, and a crown. And the chaplain would say, and a trumpet, if you don't mind. (laughs) Isn't it interesting, that song that we used to sing, I'm satisfied with, I'm not sure how many of us were really satisfied with just a little silver and a little gold. Uh, They've done a survey. Most people believe that they could be satisfied if they had about twice what they have now. And the people who have twice what you have believe that they could be satisfied if they just had twice what they had. And what this hymn writer was saying, he says, I'll I'll be satisfied when all my desires that I have here on this earth are finally filled. I, I want a gold one that's silver lined. And I wonder if that's biblical. You see, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That was in the ESV. Let me read to you this same passage out of the New Living Translation. The most important thing you're going to hear this morning from this pulpit is the word of God. Let's listen again. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you've always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live in almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. If I was to try and summarize what Paul has said into one short sentence, it would be this. A contented life is not based on what a person has, but on how much that person relies on Christ. Contentment isn't based on what you have, but on how much you rely on Christ. Everything in life gives us opportunity for discontentment. Our spouse can bring discontentment to us. Our children can bring discontentment. Grandchildren, I'm still working to see if they do, but but grandchildren (laughs) can bring discontentment. Our vocation, our housing, our our car, our Greek exam. (laughs) DTS can be uh, something that can bring discontentment. You started off so excited coming to DTS. I remember what it was like as I came to Dallas Theological Seminary to study. I was living out in Cairnport, Saskatchewan. I sold what I could and bought a school bus. It was actually a church bus. Tore out the seats, loaded in everything I could into that school bus to move down here for a couple of years. And I was so excited to be following God's will until I got to Minot, North Dakota. When I looked under the bus and there the water was coming out of the water pump on July 4th weekend, God provided. 
The next day, we were traveling along, so excited to be headed to Dallas, when chunks of rubber began to come off my tire on the bus. And I had to stop and drive a number of miles to find a couple of used tires to put in the bus. I was still excited about God's will for my life, just not quite as excited or quite as rich as I used to be when I had left Cairnport. I remember getting down to Mesquite, Texas and unloading that bus. My kids were small and so I was doing it myself and we didn't even have a fridge in our house. We had one in the bus and I had to run an a extension cord out to the bus so that we could have something cold to drink and being pretty excited because we were going to church the next day with a pastor who had come from Canada, the only person I knew down here. And I went to Reinhardt Bible Church that next day and the pastor resigned that morning. I remember thinking, but this is not quite turning out the way I had hoped. <laughs> and then I took a course in the Gospels, and I had two professors, Dr. Dwight Pentecost and Dr. Stan Toussaint. And they gave me 20 questions that first day and said, uh, next week if you would just have these 20 questions ready. It took me between half an hour and an hour for each one of those questions. I, I just spent... And um, I gave him what I knew that next week when they asked me to respond. And at the end of it, Dr. P said, now is that all? <laughs> is that all? Like I've spent an hour developing this here. And he proceeded to help me see deeper into the scriptures. And I remember thinking, boy, I'm not sure if I'll make it. I remember at the end of November not having enough money for our family to eat. And those of you in my class know the story of how our nine-year-old daughter became a studio musician and her voice on 50% of all Barney the Purple Dinosaur shows and she provided food for our family for two and a half years. I can remember in my third year at Dallas with very little help coming from the believers up there in Canada, I had an opportunity to work here on the campus of Dallas Theological Seminary. And what a great rejoicing time it was, but I remember thinking, boy, I don't have very much. Luke's closet was a tremendous help to us during that time. Paul says here, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, verse 10, and now at length you've revived your concern for me. You've, you've been concerned, you just haven't had any opportunity. This here comes in the context of the book of Philippians where Paul is encouraging his readers to rejoice, to have gratitude in their hearts to have a spirit of thankfulness and rejoicing for all that God has done for them. Meanwhile, Paul is under house arrest. Meanwhile, Paul could begin to grumble and complain. He could feel a sense of entitlement that as an apostle and minister who has planted churches, they owe it to him to provide for him. But Paul says, no. I'm not going to look to churches. I'm not going to look... A little bit of feedback there. I'm not going to look to churches. I'm not going to, to, to look to, 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 to people. I'm going to look to the Lord God to provide for me. And so when the Philippians do have an opportunity to give to him, he is extremely thankful, but he goes on to say, I want you to understand that my contentment is not based on merely what I receive. My contentment is based on something far deeper. So he goes on in verse 11 to say, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. To be content. To have an attitude that when you're in the center of God's will, that whatever is happening to you is God's will for you. When you don't have an attitude of contentment, You've got an attitude of grumbling and complaining. You begin to covet. You become dissatisfied. You become frustrated and worried. You're always needing just a little bit more. And you have a sense of entitlement. You believe that you should be receiving what that other person is getting or you should be having this. Uh, the word Paul uses for contentment here is the only time he uses it. In the New Testament, there are four different Greek words for contentment. They're, they're synonyms. They all have something in, in common. But he is speaking here about an attitude that says God is in charge. 
And that if God saved me and took care of the penalty of my sins, I'm going to trust him to take care of my life until I get to heaven. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, Now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And you're saying, what type of food? What type of clothing? How much? But Paul is saying false teachers are the ones who go after godliness, go after religious life so that they can gain material. He says, we're not into that. We're into following the Lord with contentment. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 5 and 6 says this, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? See, when you don't have much, you begin to really examine your motive for why you're living for the Lord. When you don't have much, you really begin to count on the presence of the Lord with you. As long as the Lord is with you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul speaks of all the hardships and difficulties that he's been facing, and including his thorn in the flesh. And he said, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's grace becomes sufficient for Paul. The Lord understands that we need material things for the basic maintenance of life. You can't live without water. You, you can't live without food. But I'm afraid that we here in the North American church have bought into some sort of false um, doctrine of just how much we need. I remember being over there at Jets and taking a young student out for uh, a meal. I said, uh, we won't go any place fancy. I said, let's, let's just go over to Pizza Hut. He said, oh, sir, he said, we don't need to go to such a nice place. I said, it's just Pizza Hut. He said, have you ever been? He said, well, once for, for a party. I said, well, let's just go. And he didn't even want to order a pizza all by himself. And I encouraged him, look, just order a personal pan pizza and get something to drink. He said, no, just water. I remember the whole meal cost me about $10. And as I came back to the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary, I mentioned to the president that I had taken the student out, I said he was somewhat hesitant. He said, Stephen, he said, I, I, I don't say this to embarrass you, but he said, that young man has $10 a week to live on for his food. You spent $10 last night on that meal. And I thought, you know, to me, that, 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 that was just nothing. That, that was just the bare necessities of life I was doing. I just had a pizza and some garlic bread and a little salad and a drink. <laughs> That's, that's just, no. and I thought, I, I wonder what this young man is thinking and how he must have to depend upon the Lord. Paul says, I've learned to be content. I want you to know as students, this is not a spiritual gift that comes to you without a great deal of effort. Contentment is not natural. I find I can be discontent with the simplest thing. Too much spice on my T-bone steak is enough to just say, uh, this is no good. And, and Paul is saying, I've learned to be content. It doesn't mysteriously appear. How do you learn contentment? You pray. You ask the Lord to help you learn to be content. And then you begin to study and believe and put into practices the wonderful biblical truths such as God's providence, God's sovereignty, God's sufficient grace. You wean yourself off a dependency and a desire for things. You, you, you take a real effort to say, these are not what I need. My needs are not always true needs. They're mostly wants. And Paul says, I have learned that in whatever situation I find myself in, 
Now, in the context here, Paul is speaking primarily about material possessions, material goods. But I think that there is a principle here that goes beyond just providing for us materially. You need to learn to become content in your singleness. If you don't become content when you're single, marriage won't solve that problem. You'll just bring your discontentment into your marriage. And if you think you're going to be content once you have children, <laughs> well, hardly need to say anything about that. You, you think, man, this little child who's just going to love and adore me all, you have children. If you're discontent, children will never be able to satisfy you. You say, well, if I could just get out of DTS, then I could be content. Because in ministry, it's wonderful. People <laughs> come like little chicks with open mouths Sunday morning for me to feed them. And they love Greek and Hebrew. They just reach forward for it. And you begin to discover that sometimes ministry, because if you've not learned to be content, ministry won't be enough to satisfy you. And if you just have a little bit more money, if you could just have enough money so that you had some extra in the bank so that you didn't have to worry if, if, if your air conditioner broke down or, or your car broke down, if you haven't learned to be content in Christ and in Christ alone, those other things bring a measure of contentment, but they will never really address your deepest need. In Christ alone, I put my trust. Paul says, in whatever situation, seminary is going to be a unique time in your life. The amazing thing is, for some of you, you will have more during these years than you've ever had before. Notice Paul says, I've been learned to be content content when I've got a little or a lot? Say, man, if I had a lot, I'd be content. The amazing thing is sometimes when we have a lot, we can still be very discontent. We can become discouraged. We can become uh, uh, desirous of more because we turn to the material possessions for our satisfaction. For some of you who are international students, you may have more here at DTS than you've ever had back home. For some of you, you're going to have less while you're here than you've ever had before. You, you came from a, a good position and a job and you had all sorts of things available and, and now you have less. And Paul says, look, I have learned to be content with plenty or not, with hunger, with abundance, or with need. In every, any and every circumstance, Paul says, I'm learning to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. What is his secret? What's this mystery? I can do all things through Christ, through the one who gives me strength. Christ alone is what we need. Not only for the penalty of our sin, but for living the Christian life. When you turn to Christ and you find your strength in Him, it is amazing what you can face. I have not done this consistently in my life. I'm learning it. It's just, I find it so easy to be critical. They teach you that at seminary, you know. They teach you to analyze and, and to critique. And the trouble is, you, you get that and you take it into your life. And we begin to critique the Lord God. Because when we're not content, we're saying, God, you're not giving me what I need. God, you don't understand what I'm going through. God, if you really understood, you would do this and this and this. And Paul asked for relief from his thorn in the flesh. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I want to challenge you and encourage you as students here at Dallas Theological Seminary to take this opportunity when you have little or you have lots to learn to be content with what Christ can do in your life. Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost in his book, The Joy of Living, says this, Christ has become the center of Paul's life. The will of God has become the standard of his life. The joy of God has become the fullness of his life so that in Christ he has found perfect rest, satisfaction, and contentment. He can testify that he's not looking to material things or material rewards to fill up his cup of satisfaction. 
His cup is being filled by Jesus Christ. This past Sunday at Waterbrook, as we sang our courses, we sang the song by Chris Tomlin, Enough. And let me end with this. All of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy me with your love. And all I have in you is more than enough. You're my supply, my breath of life, and still more awesome than I know, you're my reward worth living for, and still more awesome than I know. More than all I want, more than all I need, you are more than enough for me. More than all I know, more than all I can say, you are more than enough for me. When Christ becomes that for you, you and I can be content. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, taking care of the penalty of our sin. Thank you for rising again. Thank you for sending your spirit. Thank you for being with us day after day so that we do not need to fear. Thank you for taking care of us in your way and at your time, not according to what we determine our needs are or what our condition is. Thank you, Father for sending the sufficient grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And may I and my brothers and sisters here discover this year to a greater extent that Christ is all we need. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>